Hey guys, and welcome to the Business as Usual podcast, episode 11. Um, I'm here with Matt as usual, and we've got a guest on this week. Uh, We've got MJ, the fellow actuary now. I keep wanting to say student actuary. (laughs) I've been following you for so long. (laughs) Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Congratulations, by the way. No, thank you. And I must say, it was like a big thing because I was like, do I change it from student to fellow? Because... The reason I wanted to keep it maybe on student was a lot of my videos are very much opinionated and they're not of a professional, you know, opinion, you know, like proper advice. So I wanted to maybe keep that disclaimer of student, but I thought, no, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be a student for like 50 years. Let me just take the, (laughs) take the pain pill and change it to fellow and maybe like make a bit of a celebration around it. So like, as soon as I qualified, I was like, yeah, let's change it to fellow. Uh, You worked long enough for it. So... Yeah. <laughs> how long? How long was it? In total, um, it was eight years. It was eight years to. It, it was weird. It was seven years to finish all the exams, and then it took another year to get into the the profession. And that's just because okay. you have to do professionalism courses. You have to fill in work based skills. You know, there's a whole bunch of administrative jumps that you have to go through once you've passed all the exams and and it was a little bit frustrating and like I even you know remarked saying I thought the exams were the hardest part I'm not trying to get through this process because <laughs> yeah they and, and the thing is every time you send an email it's like three weeks before you get a reply so it's like three weeks uh, oh you actually needed this document and then three weeks later oh my god yeah and they kept changing it I was I was at the stage where and that's why hopefully it's better now but I was in that interim stage where they're going from an old method to a new method and oh, okay. the new method kept like changing, so they kept shifting the goalposts, and that's why it took a like a further year to get this qualification. So it was frustrating, but uh, yeah, thankfully I finally I've got you. I've got the fellowship of the Actuarial Society, and then I wrote another exam to become a Chartered Enterprise Risk Actuary, which is a a global association, and they were pretty much formed in the wake of the recession of you know that hit two thousand eight two thousand and nine. They're like, let's actually create a a risk professional who understands both financial markets, financial institutions, and the nature of uncertainty. And that's kind of what that profession's in. And banks have been very keen on snapping up people in this industry, which has been great for the actuaries because no longer do we just playing with financial institutions of insurer, pension fund, um, and, and investment houses. We're now incorporating banks as well. So we kind of like yeah, putting our fingers in all the all the financial pies. Um, did yeah? I was gonna say, did the JFC have any influence on you actually going down that route of actuary? Did the what? Did the JFC? Um, it it it's weird. I mean, the the, the JSC. It's like when I was at school, I was very much a big follower of the Johannesburg Yacht Stock Exchange, like looking at markets. Um, I, I had this crazy, this crazy dream to be the richest man in the world back when I was at school. Um, so I was reading all of Warren Buffett, looking at Carl Icahn, George Soros, you know, all the big financial heavyweights trying to figure out, you know, what did they do to become so wealthy? And that was basically the goal. The goal was to become wealthy. Um, and that's why I took actuarial science because I was like, I want to get into finance. And I was like, my brother's a chartered accountant and I was going to go that route. Um, cause I thought, you know, they look at the balance sheets, the income statements, they understand how businesses work. Uh, but then I looked at actuarial science and I was like, well, we're taking another look at finance. So I thought with my brother doing the CA route, and I doing the actuarial route, we were able to complement each other. Turns out that's not the case. We just argue all the time about finance. I don't think we have any opinions <laughs> aligned, uh, which becomes a lot of fun when it comes to managing the family finances because the parents are like, you know, because my brother's got his master's in finance, chartered accountant, and I've got my actuarial fellowship in finance. And they're like, okay, kids, we spent a lot of money on your education. What should we do? <laughs> And my brother's like, we need to gear. And I'm like, we need to go and, you know, hedge our liabilities. And we've got these two conflicting ideologies. So, but yeah, uh, coming coming back to the, the whole story is, so yeah, so I studied actuarial science because I heard it was difficult. I heard it was a challenge. I heard you made a lot of money and I heard you understood the financial system really well from it. So it aligned with my goals at the time. Um, unfortunately, living in South Africa, we were victims to quite a, brutal crime, you know, guys came in with guns, armed robbery, stole everything in the house. And 
from that incident, I kind of, it's, it's weird, you know, people sometimes have post-traumatic stress, and I mean, I had that to a certain degree, I was paranoid for two years afterwards, um, which eventually led me to moving to Cape Town, but what it also did, it kind of shook me from the whole idea that money is everything. I kind of took more of a focus mm. that, you know, family, experiences, memories, friends, um, knowledge just for the sake of knowledge, and, and just, yeah, the the other side of life, not just just uh, money, which put me in a bit of a predicament because I was halfway through my, you know, this happened in second year AXA, um, and the motivation had always been, I'm going to become the richest man in the world, and now the motivation was, ooh, I've started this thing, let me let me finish it. Um, and I, I am fortunate in the sense that I've got that personality where I enjoy, I just enjoy learning. Um, like I was telling you before we started, I went, you know, bought all these, all these random books of uh, take a lot. Um, this one's on psychology, yeah. the other one's on science, philosophy. I, you know, I've got that personality where I like learning for fun. So I was able to continue the actuarial course because I actually enjoyed the material. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm learning to become mega wealthy. It's more like I'm learning to complete the degree. I'm finding this, this stuff interesting. And like I said, the plan was then to move to Cape Town as soon as I finished. Uh, my lecturer told me that that was career suicide. He said there are no jobs in Cape Town. Um, you know, all the finance happens here in Johannesburg. And I was like, stuff that I'm going to Cape Town. I want to live a happy lifestyle rather than just a money chasing lifestyle. And I mean, yeah, there's, there's not as many jobs uh, in Cape Town as there are in Johannesburg, especially for, for actuaries. Um, but fortunately... With my YouTube channel, um, I got a little bit of an international exposure. I had some clients reach out from, uh, reach out to me, you know, via LinkedIn and these other social media channels. And being in South Africa, you know, we we have a very weak currency, so we're actually very cheap compared to to other other nations. Um, our living yeah. expenses are lower, so we don't need that much of a, of a high salary. So the crazy thing is, so I actually do a lot of my work for international clients and. Well, it's one of the great things about being an actuary is as long as you're behind a laptop, you can be anywhere in the world. So if you want to be on the beaches in Mauritius or the Maldives, um, <laughs> you can do that. You can do that. You don't have to go into the office. You don't have to, um, you know, always be there. And especially now with like technology like this, I mean, I'm having a, a meeting with a client maybe, you know, on average once a day. And we can do it using yeah. technology like Zoom, Skype, uh, Google Hangouts. And I mean, these clients are coming from everywhere, from Tel Aviv to Paris to London to America. Um, you know, you, the world really is global. And the nice thing with, say, actuarial science compared to, say, accounting is, uh, you know, in accounting, you've got two different systems. You've got GARP and you've got IFRS, you know, the American system and like the European system. With actuarial science, it's pretty much, you know, statistics is statistics. Probability is probability. Um, yes, there's regulation that changes a bit, but you know it's not like accounting where a lot of the information is rule based. That's very much localized. So there is that that advantage. Um, like for instance, if you had to study tax, then your knowledge is very much localized. Where if you study um, insurance, those principles are are global. So it's also one of the nice things about becoming an actuary is you do have this international. Um, you know, playground to go in, and the fellowship in South Africa is recognised by that in the UK. Uh, it's recognised by the guys in Australia as well. So we've kind of, you know, once you get into this actuarial club, you kind of have a ticket to work wherever you want to work. And people know, wow, you spent eight years getting into this this professional, this club. Um, we know you're going to be trustworthy because if you don't, we can report you to your profession and you can get kicked out. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like when it comes to you know banking and lending, when I go into um, a business deal, my collateral is these eight years of studying that I've put in, that I'm risking. You know, yeah. If I do a bad job, I could lose this. And, mm -hmm. and that's why it's weird. Sometimes I don't even get hired to do actuarial work. Sometimes it's just like generic business work. And the clients are prepared to take me on because there is that trustworthy factor that comes with being an actuary. So it's not like every single job is, you know, doing hardcore statistics and modeling. Sometimes it is generic business, um, but you still get paid the actuarial rate because you are coming in with that trust factor. So it's definitely, it, it, that's why, I mean, I'm very passionate about the subject. I really do encourage people to study it. 
to go through all the way, you know, not just get an actuarial degree, but to go into the profession as well, because it does open business prospects. And fortunately, um, like I said, like my lecturer telling me going to Cape Town was career suicide. Fortunately, that's no longer the case with the internet, with the age of communication. Uh, you can work wherever you want. So if you're, you know, in some weird little country, you can become an actuary and then do business in America and England over the internet. So I think yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. So for people sitting and listening to this who don't know what an actuary is, do you want to just give a, a brief, quick rundown on what, what an actuary actually does? No, sure, sure thing. And I mean, it's it's a it's a bit of a like a like a joke in the profession is because you know how do you answer this question? You know, what is an actuary? And because we write so many exams. Um, the, the classic answer is it like it depends how many marks this question is for. You know, if it's worth one mark, you're going to get a different answer to whether it's a 20 mark question. Um, but I mean, yeah, it, it's it's weird. After eight years, it's kind of like you know what what is actuarial, what is non-actuarial, and I've kind of come up, come up with a little bit of a nutshell answer, and that is actuaries look at financial uncertainties, and that's basically it. So if it's finance and if it's got anything to do with uncertainty. Um, actuaries can add a lot of value. So your traditional actuary is in life insurance uh, because you know you're paying a financial payout when somebody dies, but that death event is uncertain. So hello, an actuary can come play in that space. And then they saw that they can okay. use their techniques on all insurance, uh, from car insurance, household insurance, um, you know, legal insurance, all these things. Um, and then what we also saw is pensions. It, it's weird. Pensions is an interesting one because we went from being the champions of pension funds when it was something called a defined benefit. This is when a company said, when you retire, we will give you X amount in order to continue living. Um, and you needed an actuary in that place because it was a very, very difficult calculation. And for, for various reasons, uh, the world seems to have shifted away from something called defined benefit to define contribution. And what it is now, it is companies, instead of saying, when you retire, we will make sure you have enough money to continue living. What they're saying now is, we will put aside a little bit of, of your salary every month into a fund, and we just yeah. hope it's enough when you retire. We just hope. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, well, it's like, well, okay, you don't, you no longer need an actuary anymore because yes, it's still financial, but there's no longer uncertainty because the employers have shifted that uncertainty and that risk from themselves onto the, the individuals. Um, and that you know, has opened a whole big market now for financial um, advisors because now it's up to the person to handle this risk. And normally these individuals cannot normally afford the fees of an actuary. It was normally the pension fund, because they were so huge, they could hire the top um, actuaries to come in and help them you know, create an investment strategy um, and I mean, some of them, they still do. So some of the defined contributions still get actuaries to help with the investment process, but yeah. we're not as required as before. Like now you could get an accountant, you could get a CFA, you could get, you know, another financial professional to perform that function. It's not as critical as it was before. Um, but then having said that actuaries, th those are kind of like your traditional areas. And then actuaries have created what we call wider fields. Um, the one wider field was something called health insurance or medical aid. Uh, there it was like, okay, health is becoming a really expensive item. Um, medical aids are a bit more interesting because, you know, there's a lot of regulation. There's a lot of rules that they can and cannot do. And so actuaries have to price products in a certain way that, you know, satisfies both ends. Um, but yeah, health insurance is a big one that actuaries have been getting into. Uh, the one that I've gone into has been investments. So this is building investment strategies um, and normally for the, the insurance company. So an insurance company or a life office or a pension fund will say, you know, this is, these are our liabilities. This is how much money we have invested in such a way that we make money and our liabilities are covered. That's basically my, my uh, thing that I've specialized the highest at or the fellowship in that. Um, but yeah. then also, like I said, specialized in risk management which we're seeing banks are getting very much interested in and banks are actually becoming one of the big employers of actuaries now, especially here in South Africa. Um, yeah. Yeah. Banks coming in and they like us when it comes to building credit models and credit scores and 
just general, you know, is this a good business to invest in, um, that type of thing. And then, of course, there's also the... It's crazy that they haven't done that until now. Yeah. Like, it, it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, you know what? Actuaries, and this, this is the thing, is actuaries have kind of like lived in the shadows um, of the financial yeah. world. Um, and I think this is because, I mean, you, you look at your typical actuary, their, their personality, I mean, the big joke is, you know, what do actuaries use as birth control and it's like their personality. Um, you know, they, we kind of have this image of being, of being nerds and, and that was something that we really try to push forward. So in countries where actuaries are required by regulation, um, we, especially here in South Africa, we had a bit of a, bit of a turf war. Uh, the lawyers said that they should be the ones doing uh, the regulation because they said insurance uh, are basically selling contracts and as lawyers they understand contracts better than anybody else. Why they lost to the actuaries is because the actuaries were able to show how complicated and how mathematical these calculations were required in order to know how much you know, money to reserve, when to take profit, when not to, when to reinsure, all these things. That the actuaries actually got given those what we call statutory roles uh, by governments um, and in order to get that actuaries had to say well it's because we're the nerdiest and these these are hard, hard projects <laughs> so actuaries kind of and the thing is because we required by regulation and stuff like that and there's not that many of us actuaries earn a lot without having to do any marketing you know they don't have to be in the news yeah. you know it's being like oh look at me hire me I'm an actuary I'm smart because there's a lot of work to do and they're getting paid top dollar and like I say, they're a little bit nerdy, so they've lived in the shadows. Whereas your accountants and your lawyers, you know, a lawyers are always on the stand when there's a big case and it's a big scandal and the media takes over, or there's normally like an accounting issue or some corporate failure. You know, accountants are then in the news giving their opinions and that type of stuff. Because actuaries generally do such a good job and insurance companies don't blow up as often, especially like here in South Africa, insurance companies are very, very solvent. Um, we're not in the news. People don't really know about us. So it's it's weird. We we have kind of got this persona of being nerdy and unknown. That's why a lot of people don't know what actuaries do, even though we play such a pivotal role in in the financial markets. But yeah, we kind of like those those guys in the shadows. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's kind of blowing my mind that. <clears throat> the banks when building credit models or anything haven't haven't used actuaries up until recently. So what what is different to what an actuary would do versus what the banks are doing currently to assess someone's credit? Well, well I mean, th th this is the thing is, and, and that's why I say it becomes interesting to say, you know, what is actuarial and what is non-actuarial? Because people, other people can do our job. You know, um, data scientists can build models. Statisticians understand probability. Uh, CFAs understand finance. Accountants also know regulation and, and all these type of things. So the reason why I think banks haven't have taken so long to hire us is because there's been other people who can do that job. And a lot of the time, actuaries have been focused on life insurance and those statutory roles. And because that work is so comfortable, we haven't really needed to venture out. Um, it's kind of the banks who were just kind of looking at it. And I think what started happening is, is banks started selling insurance of their own. So they started hiring actuaries for actuarial purposes. Let's call actuarial purposes life insurance. And I think the actuaries within those teams who started saying, well, credit models are using basically the same principles that we're doing. Let us have a go at making a model. They made the model. Banks saw, wow, look how great these results were. And now banks, I think, have stumbled across the fact that, hey, even though everybody else can kind of do what, what actuaries do, actuaries, and I know this comes across a little bit arrogant, but we do it a little bit better. And the reason why I think we do it better is because we're exposed to finance and we're exposed to uncertainty. So we're learning all about business and we're learning all about statistics. Whereas before, your bank would maybe have an individual as the statistician and an individual as the accountant put them in a team and, you know, try and make them work together. But when it comes to certain things in a model, um, you, you want someone who understands the delicacy. So let's say you get a statistician to build you a model, let's say a, a cash flow model, you know, calculate the non-present value. Um, they might just say, ah, interest rates, you know, um, 
interest rates was you know 10% last year, let's make it 10% this year, or something like that. And they just put it put it forward. Whereas an actuary will be like, yeah. you know what? Interest rates themselves follow their own stochastic path, and they're you know they're very sensitive uh, to you know the, the output of the model. This is something that we need to actually spend more time figuring out and all this type of stuff. So I mean, this is a very much an imagined example, but actuaries would look at those parameters and kind of get a they would have a bit of a more a good a good feeling, I guess, of the stochastic nature of various parameters, whereas let's say an accountant running the model might you know undermine the, the uncertainty and say okay you know let's rather make a deterministic model or a statistician wouldn't understand which ones to put in but like i said that's a very high level imagined example um and like i said there, there could be other reasons but that's kind of how how i see it is that because of this blend of knowledges that actuaries have it's made them more powerful than two people on either side of the, yeah. the thing trying to do the same task yeah, okay. So I think maybe let's move into, because our audience is a little bit more um, like into sort of stock market and, and um, that sort of area of finance. Mm -hmm. So do you want to just give a maybe a basic one of maybe what an actuary would do um, if they're directly sort of working within the stock market? Okay, cool. So look, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting thing because like I say, when, when I wrote my uh, financial exam, this investment thing, um, we we studied quite closely to the CFA Level 3 students. So we would follow CFA yeah. Level 3 blogs. Um, we would go to their events. They would come to ours. There was quite a bit of, of shared shared uh, learning. The thing is, is that we play in two completely different parts in the investment game. Um, and I think a lot of people, they look at the stock market and they think, oh, you know, when I go to the stock market, I'm picking, you know, do I want to buy this share? Do I want to buy that share? And, you know, I hold on and I get my little dividends and then I maybe trade it during the day and stuff like that. Um, actuaries, funnily enough, even though we learn about the stock market, we learn about equities and we do all that type of stuff, we tend to stay away from stock selection. We stay away from stock uh, selection. We think technical analysis is a load of rubbish and we're even quite wary on fundamental analysis as, as well. Um, I mean, we, we're quite aware that, especially in, in uh, you know, public companies, there is information that they're holding back. They are releasing you know, profit and loss statements that are trying to make themselves the most tax efficient. And the data is quite convoluted to kind of give a proper um, view. We also very much kind of subscribe to the philosophy that the market is more efficient than I guess what a, a day trader would say. You know, a day trader would say the market is yeah. inefficient. If I learn more, I can outsmart the market. Whereas an actuary kind of says, you know what, the amount of time and effort I'd have to put in to get a little bit of an advantage and that little bit of advantage is probably not worth it. So where actuaries play in is we play very much at a high level. So I'll give you an example of, of what would happen is um, either a pension fund or a life uh, office or an insurance company um, or even a bank, uh, but maybe, maybe not so much a bank, but generally a big financial institution will come to us and they'll say, help us devise our investment strategy. And what uh, as an actuary will do is we will first say, okay, cool, um, let's define your liabilities. So we, we start off with the liability side of the balance sheet. Like I said, that's well, very different to my brother, whose accountants, they're focusing on assets. How do you maximize your returns? Actuaries on the other side is, you know, how do we control risks? You know, so we look at the liabilities. Um, we look at yeah. liabilities and we're very sensitive to regulation constraints. So we make sure that we're playing within the boundaries of whatever the institution is. In South Africa with pension funds, the big regulation is called Regulation 28, um, which basically puts in a bunch of, like a skeleton of what you can and cannot do. What we then do is with the regulations and understanding our clients' liabilities, we then go into an investment strategy. And an investment strategy, I mean, it, it can be as simple as saying 60% bonds, 40% equity. You know, that at the end of the day, that could be our, our little answer. Um, of course, where it gets a little bit interesting is let's say that 40% equity, what do we do? Well, we say, is the market efficient or is it inefficient? If we think the market's efficient, we're going to go down the passive trail. So we're going to say, okay, we're going to go passive investing. 
And then what we will do is we will look at all the various passive strategies. Um, you know, you've got synthetic index tracking funds, you've got others that buy the whole market, you've got others that have got different weighting parameters. And we'll say, okay, which one's the most appropriate with the, the most cost efficient uh, fee? And we'll go and put our money behind those. Or if we think that the market is inefficient, we then ask a different question. We say, okay, um, can, can an asset manager add value? And if the answer is no, then once again, we go to the passive or the index tracking funds. If we say an asset manager can add value, this is where the fund starts coming in because now we start, now we start really thinking, do we want a single manager? So do we want to put all our money with say one company and trust them? Do we want to go with a bunch of multiple managers? Um, and there's pros and cons to each one. Like, why you want to maybe go multiple managers is you can find a specialist in each one. But if you go to one single manager and you come with a massive amount of money, you can get a reduced fee. And if, you know, shaving half a, half a percent of your fees can play out really big in, say, 40 years' time. And that's the thing. Actually, we're, we're playing on big time frames. So we have this whole, this whole um, a lot of thought process goes in not into which stock should we buy or sell, but which asset managers should we employ or not employ. And we will look at their philosophies. We will look at their structures. We will look at, you know, what have they done in the past? Where are they going forward? We will construct the mandates. We will do all these various things. And it's your asset managers that are the CFA, CFA level three, or it can be, you know, another financial professional. And what tends to happen is, at the end of the day, this is where it gets weird. We don't actually make the final choice. What will happen is the client will make the final choice, or for a pension fund, the trustees make the final choice. But what you have is you'll have the trustees will sit down and one by one, it's almost like a bit of a beauty parade. Each asset manager will come in and they'll say, look, this is how well we invest. This is what we do. They'll maybe give some free pens and the trustees will be like, oh, wow, this is great. And five or six different asset managers will be invited to do this. And then my role would be to say, you know, that guy's talking a load of crap. You know, that stock that he bought in, it's about to... You know, or, or that stock that he's going into, I've heard bad things about, um, or that philosophy contradicts his investment style. Uh, you know, so you, you kind of look at those type of things. But at the end of the day, it is the trustees or the client that makes the decision. We give that, you know, that actual advice. Um, and that's why I'm a little bit worried about my YouTube channel because, you know, actuaries give advice. And I mean, my channel, I'm there, you know, just shouting my mouth out and ranting and raving. So <laughs> I always have to put lots of disclaimers on, on everything there. Um, yeah. And but but yeah, so that's kind of where actuaries play. As for the actuary that that I've become would play in that space where we basically we don't pick stocks, we pick the asset managers um, to yeah complete our strategy. And and then yeah then but the thing is the job's not done there. What we also do, and I think this is maybe what makes us a little bit annoying, is we monitor. We monitor everything. So we will look. Let's say we give our money to an asset manager. We will be not just looking at their returns. We will be looking at their returns for a whole bunch of various adjustments. Uh, we will be seeing, you know, was their style drift? Were they taking excessive risk? You know, were they doing this? Were they doing that? Could they have done better? And I mean, it really starts getting intense. You start building synthetic asset managers to compare against them, and then fees become another thing altogether, especially if they've got a performance fee, but then the fee goes down a bit. Is there a watermark? Is there not? Is there a clawback if you come back? Is there a surrender penalty? You know, it starts really getting um, intense. And also, you've got to imagine, you also now start shifting between asset managers because maybe I go as an actuary, I say, the economy is turning in such a way that we need to get out of our asset managers and back into passive funds, or we need to go from our passive funds into these asset managers. But we're talking about clients that have close to like a trillion, a trillion dollars. You know, this is, I mean, the, yeah. sorry, the, the pension industry, it's, you know, it's, it's in the trillions. Um, in South Africa, the, the PIC, which is the, the local one here, is, is a trillion rand. So we, we're really talking about big sums of money. So when it comes to move from passive to active, it's not as simple as what, you know, you and I can do where we, oh, click sell, click buy. Um, Something yeah. like that would shift the market, could spook the market. So it's kind of like, how do we slowly move our, our position from here to here? And that's where we start playing with, you know, derivatives, creating various derivatives, yeah. especially in the short term when we play hedging strategies. And we really do start getting really complicated really quickly. Um, so that's why I say it's, it's, it's an interesting job because at the one level, we basically say, 
60% bonds, 40% equities, but then, and it could be as, as simple as, oh, the market's efficient, put that 40% into an index tracking fund, or it can be as complicated as going all the way drilling down and looking at all these various things with asset managers and that type of stuff. So it's, yeah. it, 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 what I guess, you know, what is, what is interesting is, is that, I mean, there was this one guy, I'm trying to think what his, what his name was. When I was reading up on all these guys who made their money on the stock market, um, I think his name was John something, something, a very generic name. But he said, he says, I don't play the market. He says, I play the players. He says, I look at the psychology of everybody else and I make my trades on that. If everyone's getting greedy on a certain chair, I'm going to make sure I sell out of that before the fear sets in. Or if everyone's fearful, you know, I'm going to come in and, and but basically he, he plays the, the market participants rather than the actual assets in the, the market. And yeah. what's cool about that, especially now with say, actuarial science, is as an actuary, you're learning about pension funds, you're learning about these financial institutions, you're learning about the regulations, you're learning what they can and cannot do. And they've got a lot of money that they have to invest every single month. So I kind of look at this and I'm like, hold on, hold on. I, and, and, and it's weird, like before this call, I thought, let me just check, check to see, see if my thinking's correct. But um, let's say, quick, quick example, Regulation 28 in South Africa says 60% has to go into bonds, okay, has to. Okay. I know that the biggest player in the market has to buy a minimum of 60% bonds. The equity market in South Africa is currently not doing that well, so even a higher amount than usual is going into bonds, okay. Now, bonds are relatively, have a fixed supply. Governments can lend, you know, up to a certain threshold, but the more they lend, the more it hurts their credit rating. So they normally have to stay within a certain, there's only so much, you know, government debt that they can release. So your supply yeah. is kind of fixed, but your demand every month is constant and it's pushing and it's high. And that's why you go and you look at any bond market right now. And, I, and this was a little check I was looking, even in Australia, I mean, the Australian 30 year bond is up 22% in the past six months. Okay, I mean, you're not getting those returns on, on the stock market. You know, the stock market, oh, you may be 2% up this month, 3% down the next month, 5% up the next month. Bonds, it's like, it's just like there's this massive momentum. And the thing is, you, you look at countries that are very developed, like Japan, their bonds have now become negative, negative yields, which means for every $100 you put in, you're going to get $99 back. And you're like, that's crazy. And it's like, well, because the pension funds, the biggest players in the market, are being forced to purchase an asset, even though it's giving a negative return, they're being forced to buy it. So that's why it's actually, like, let's say a Japanese bond, for example, there could actually be a trading opportunity there. Because, yes, you're buying the bond now and at $100, and, yes, you can only redeem it at 99 But let's say everyone keeps buying these bonds, which means more bonds can only be redeemed at 95 or 94 and your bond's now at 99 you can sell that for a profit. So it, it's weird. You can even make money on negative yield bonds. And, and that's why like, I, I look at it and because you know, I'm kind of getting to the stage now where I need to start investing. I've been working as an actuary for a bit now. Um, I've got a bit of a nest egg. You know, half of it's in Bitcoin, which is very risky, very, very crazy. Um, and I, you know, the other half's just sitting in cash at the moment, which I need to, I need to invest properly. And I'm actually looking more at the bond market than in the stock market. Like I said, stock market, each company is hiding, you know, very, very key information because it's proprietary or they, you know, want to dodge the tax ban and stuff like that. Governments are super transparent. I mean, and governments kind of control the, the central banks where they've got a very close tie with your central banks, which determine the interest rates, which have a drastic effect on their bonds. And they kind of like, it's quite clear, you know where they're gonna push that interest rate up or down. Um, plus, with all this constant demand and limited supply, bond market, yes, it's, it, it's been deemed as boring, but the returns are going up. And I'm even looking at, you know, maybe there's a derivative instrument out there where you go in and you say, every time the bond market moves up, you know, 0.1%, this instrument must jump up 10%. And that's the nice thing about actuarial science is we learn about these instruments. Uh, they call you know, the structured products where you can go to an investment bank and they'll make it for you. Um, and yeah, you can actually create bespoke investments that perfectly suit your needs or whatever you think the market's going to uh, you know, 
play, play out. So actuarial science gives you a really awesome insight into the financial mechanisms. Like I said, there's a lot to finance that, that I don't know, and there's a lot that I still need to learn. But actuarial science tells you these are the biggest players, this is their strategy, and it kind of also gives you the tools on how to measure government debt, you know, because we are looking at debt and uh, credit events and, and all these other things. So we, we, we know enough about uncertainty and, and risk, but we also know how the big market guys are playing. So yeah, I mean, you, if you had to put me up against some trader, he'll probably dominate me in the short term. He'll probably outmaneuver me on the stock market. He'll know what's hot and all that type of stuff. But make, extend that time frame to say 40 years and actuaries clean the floor when it comes to investing. So it's, and, and it's, it's interesting because it's, it's a long-term game. It's one of the things actuaries are kind of taught at a very early, early stage of, of the, the studying is to think 40-year periods. And, and that's why it's, it's kind of something like you look at bonds and they're actually really great instruments for, for us to play in. But like I said, they've got this, this um, what's it called? This, this appear of being boring and most of us stay away from bonds. I don't know, have you guys, have you guys ever considered investing in bonds? I'm very honest, like, I haven't, like, at all. Like, yeah. I, I'm studying finance at university right now and you do, you do your intro to finance and they tell you what a bond is and you maybe do another course where they talk about bonds and how to, how to price a bond and maybe duration of a bond or something, but everything's completely focused on equities because I guess it is the more more exciting uh, area of the market, definitely, and it's making the news. And mm -hmm. I suppose it kind of, that gets into an interesting, um, the interesting area that I've been thinking about in that uh, universities are in the business of creating people who are going to go and get jobs. Yeah. And so they're making they need to adjust their curriculum so that people out there can go and that their students can go and get this job that's really fascinating and whatnot that gets into the news and then they can say, yep, that was us. Mm -hmm. And and like that that brings in students, at least in the business area, obviously in science and engineering and whatnot, they're trying to make graduate students. Well, 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 yeah. But I think that... Yeah. Well, well this, this is exactly the thing, is the stock market is sexy. You know, you've got new uh, yeah. IPOs coming up. Oh, Snapchat's now listed or Snap, whatever. Oh, you know, Zuckerberg said something. Facebook price, you know, goes down. Elon Musk tweets. You know, it's exciting. Things are happening. New cars are coming in. Scandals, blah, craziness. Bond market, there's no new entrants. You know, all the countries are there. No. And, and their, their, yeah. their bond is a 30-year instrument, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't have that crazy volatility, there's no adrenaline rush, um, unless you want, like I said, if you, if you build derivative instruments on top of those things, it does become a, a lot more crazier. But for the general person, bonds are seen as, as boring. I mean, I even look at my, my parents and their investment strategy is between property and equity and, and cash. I'm like, have you guys ever considered bonds? My brother, oh, no, bonds are boring. You know, because that, that very much, that, that is the, the exactly. mentality. Yeah. Um, but like I said, studying actuarial science, you see the regulation and it says a minimum of 60% of pension money has to go into the bond market. And if you think about it, who's bigger than the pension funds? The pension funds are the biggest players in this market. So... And that's why you look at the size of the bond market to the size of the stock market, and you'll be surprised how much the bond market dwarfs the stock market. Yet, like I say, it's, it's weird. It's like everybody's chasing the stock market, whereas the bond, it's kind of, well, you just know. If someone says they're a hedge fund manager and someone says they're a, a bond, you know, a broker, of course you're going to think the hedge fund manager guy's a little bit more exciting and, you know, he's got more crazy stories to tell. Um, but that is one of the things that, that I really enjoy about about finance and, and that actuarial science has enlightened it's to kind of say let's take a step back from the game let's see how this whole system works and wow you know yes some money is going to equity you know there is money going to equity and it is a lot and it is funneling through but there's a massive chunk going to the bond market that you know not that many people are um, looking at 
and you've got, I mean, the credit rating agencies are very transparent with their with their views, you know, and it's not like the stock market where each analyst kind of keeps his information a little bit secret and, you know, he sells it out and all that type of stuff and companies do things, you know, silently. Governments are more transparent than corporates and that's why bonds are, are an interesting thing. Um, and then, of course, you've got uh, Europe, which was doing that whole quantitative easing where they were just going out and flooding the market by buying bonds. So now you've got... Like you've got central bank activities, you know, doing quantitative easing, pumping money into the economy by buying bonds. You've got pension funds buying bonds. And you look at bond yields and they're all like really, really, really low. So it's 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 crazy. I mean, even like like India, I was looking at the Indian bond market, and the 30-year yield of the Indian bond is less than the 24 yield, which is a little bit mind-blowing because it's supposed to be the longer the duration the more exposed you are to various risks like default, inflation, um, you know, these type of things. Yeah. Um, and people like to have their money back sooner. So it's crazy that that is, that at once lower. But it's because all these pension funds are buying the longest asset that they can find because actually say that's the best for liability matching. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing supply and demand actually stuff up these curves, or not stuff up these curves, but bend these curves to unnatural states. And for me, that's a big indication of you know how well they're they're playing and how well they're working out in the market. So it's it's interesting because I know you guys are big on stock market, big on you know which shares to pick. But I'm almost thinking I don't know. And this is like I said, I have to put a heavy disclaimers like don't take this as investment <laughs> advice. But I'm looking at the bond market. I really am looking at the bond market and saying you know what? Instead of having a portfolio of companies. I'm going to have a portfolio of countries, you know, so I have a little bit of Australian bonds, a little bit of South African bonds, a little bit of this. Look, every now and again, these companies, uh, countries do blow up, like Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. You know, you, you do get these, these defaults. It's not completely risk-free. But because it's not completely risk-free, there is still some return to get. And like I said, if you can create a derivative instrument, then you can still, uh, you know, pump up the money and, uh, and gamble almost on these movements. And if you're quite certain that, you know, there's a 70% chance that the market's going to go up, yeah, I'd rather go gamble there than in a casino where the odds are designed to be against you. So, yeah, yeah that's that's kind of so, my, yeah. yeah you, you had an um, interesting video, must be a couple of months ago now, where you, I think the title was that the stock market is dying. Mm -hmm. um, I found that video really, really interesting that you, you gave some, good reasons that I hadn't thought of for why the, the stock market may be on its way out. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit cataclysmic, but um, do you want to just give some of your thinking behind that? Because obviously the conversation we've been having. Yes. Um, well, you, you can see it's, it's kind of been my, a bit of my sentiment that equities are, are overvalued. Like I say, big disclaimer, this is, a, this is just, you know, <laughs> um, there's not a professional opinion. And I would have to do a lot more research to, to justify that. But just my feeling, let's maybe call it a feeling rather than opinion. Uh, my feeling is that the equities are, are overvalued, um, that the dividends that they're paying out are really low, the volatility is crazy, and I just think yeah, the stock market, there's so many regulations, it's so difficult for a new company to list. Um, I mean, listings are down globally. There's not as many new companies that are coming up. Um, new mechanisms are being discovered. I mean, crowdfunding was kind of the first one with Kickstarter and those type of things. Then we got something called ICOs, initial coin offerings, which were, yes, I mean, they were crazy, absolute crazy things. And I mean, it was, it was clear that they were going to get abused. I mean, anything where you give somebody a, like millions and millions of dollars before they do any work, um, and there's no consequences if they take the money and sail away on, on a yacht, you've got to be crazy to think that, oh, the person's actually going to build this you know, blue moon project that they, they pushed out. So I didn't invest in any ICOs. I, I looked at ICOs, and I actually thought that, that yeah, the market was, was going to tank, uh, but I was, I, was too, I was too soon on that, that whole blockchain thing. I was like, the market's going to blow. Either ICOs are going to come crumbling down, or this thing called Tether was going to blow up. Um, and I think I was making this in November and while I'm making this, the market's just pumping up, pumping up, pumping up. Yeah. Um, 
And then, so I was like, oh, I must have been wrong. So I got buying crypto kitties, putting in more money. I don't know, I got caught up in the frenzy. Then January comes, boom, you know. And it was a bit of a pain pill to, to swallow. Um, but I do yeah. think, yeah, I think crypto maybe... I've got a feeling, yeah, let me use the word feeling, not opinion. I've got a feeling it, it's, it's coming back. Um, yeah. But, but no, and, and that's why I, I look at that and Bitcoin kind of gives, and, and crypto kind of gives the same adrenaline rush of trading that the stock market did with less regulations. It's more exciting. Yeah. So all the things that, have, that the stock market tried to sell on, you know, being sexy, being big returns, get rich quick, all these type of things. Cryptos are doing as well, and they're doing it with less barriers to entry. I mean, you want to try to buy buy shares, and you've got to, you know, I don't know what it is in Australia, but yeah, it's like you need put proof of your address, and you need your ID document, and you have to take a selfie holding something. It's it's like yeah, where you want to invest in a crypto, you just kind of you know you find some some nerd friend, you like you know here's a hundred bucks, he sends you some coins. You then go and put it in some weird, wonderful currency. Tomorrow it's doubled in value. You then shift it around. And, and I mean, I, I had a friend who was trading at one stage up to 32 Bitcoin. Um, and then, of course, he lost it all because, you know, when you, when you start making that much money, and I think this was maybe, I was, I was guilty of this as well, but you, you start feeling that you're invincible. You do start feeling that I know the market better than anybody else. And of course, I think a lot of us did get, get smacked quite hard by crypto. Um, but I mean, it's still good. I mean, I was the coin I was mainly in was Litecoin. I got in at $3. I think now it's trading at around $85. At its peak, it was 380 So yeah, it was, yeah. it was a roller coaster ride. It was a roller, roller coaster ride. But yeah, I think because of that, the stock market is kind of very much becoming a bit of a dinosaur. Um, yeah. Even you look at the way to complete trades, I mean, Bitcoin can do it, or the blockchain can do it much quicker. And I know there are yeah. you know, companies that are looking at doing it. You look at the person who was quite high up in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, she's left to join a blockchain project. You know, these are all signs to me that there's something... And look, it, it could be going through cycles. These things do go through cycles. So maybe I should have said... Not I said, you know, the stock market is dead, but maybe the stock market's going to go in for a long sleep. Um, of course, that's not the clickbait title that you want on uh, on, on YouTube. On YouTube. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's it's interesting because yeah, that that video didn't get that many didn't get that many views, um, and yeah, it, it's it's something that I was just feeling at the time that equity is a little bit over overvalued, um, but I mean. This is another thing. Equity is very much localized. You know, the South African markets behave very differently to Australian markets. Like from what I know is Australia's has been doing pretty well. You know, the in the past yeah. ten years, Australia's done done well. Um, the markets in America seem to have gotten behind Trump and his, you know, low tax kind of regime. So America's, you know, not doing too badly. Um, but another thing with, with the stock market, what we generally see is there are these big corrections every seven to ten years. I mean, in the 2000s, we had it in 2001 with the, the tech bubble bursting. Then we had the Great Recession in 2008. Um, since 2008, there hasn't really been... Yeah. I mean, and you go before 2001, I think 90, like the high 1990s, there was the Asian crisis. In the 1980s, there was, was it Black Friday, Black Monday. You know, there's, there's been all of these, yeah. these crashes, and we haven't had a crash yet. And on the one hand, you can say, oh, it's because our risk management uh, procedures are just so much better. Or it's because, um, you know what, the market's just overcooking and it's, it's, we're just delaying it. And I know there, there, is, there is some guys in the market who are saying that the next big crisis is going to be around uh, debt, um, government debt, which is scary because, yeah. and, and, and like I say, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to look at because... Governments should have a limit to how much they can borrow. But if they're borrowing more money than, like if they're borrowing at 100 and they only have to give it back at 99, um, they're going to maybe push past certain thresholds or, you know, just replenish debt like that type of stuff. And there could be a little bit of turbulence. So it's not like the bond market is guaranteed to be smooth sailing all the way forward. There is a bit of a systemic risk. And you can imagine, you can just, if you just imagine if Trump comes out and says, you know what, 
we're going to only be paying 90 cents of each dollar that we owe, you know, and we're going to shave off some of the government debt. And, and the thing is, it's Donald Trump. He's crazy. He could do that. Um, you can imagine what the, the ripple effect of that would be. Um, other countries would say, oh, they can do it as well. There would be protests because then people aren't getting their pension money. So people go to the streets. There'd be riots. You know, it could be proper pandemonium. Um, and with someone like Trump, uh, Trump in charge, you know, we mustn't think that that is never going to happen. You know, it, and that's what it, it's. I, I keep more of a, a close eye on, on American politics than I do on South African politics because, you know, what they do kind of influences the rest of the world. Um, yeah. And that's also what makes bond, bond markets a little bit more fun is it does have that political edge as well. Whereas with the stock markets, you've got to know, you know, company, uh, you know, corporate politics, which is inaccessible to us. Unless you actually know the guys, you don't know if he's going to get kicked out of CEO next, uh, next week. Whereas at least with, with countries, you know if someone's going to get impeached. You know, the news is, is going to be all over it. Yeah. So, yeah. But like I say, I mean, it, it is a feeling and before, like let's say if I was hired by a, you know, like a pension fund to do this thing, I would do a lot more data analysis. I would go through a, a much strenuous uh, process before giving, you know, an, an informed opinion um, because it's yeah. just my money and I'm just, you know, shooting uh, some thoughts out. I have to you know, just class qualify it as saying yeah. it as feelings. So, so yeah, please. Yeah, a question. Yeah. Okay, how? How easily accessible is the data that you would actually use in, you know, some of that modeling? So, is I mean, that all provided by the pension funds, or so? So, the, do you go out and get it? Yourself? No, no. I mean, this is the lovely thing when it comes to to government bonds is that data is available. I mean, countries make their economical indicators well known. You can see inflation trends. You can see interest rate trends. You can read the central bankers' reports. You can pick up on their sentiments. Um, you know, you can do, all this data is basically there. I mean, it's, it's so much so that, I mean, what, one of the things that, that I'm very, very much interested in is technology. You know, I think that's what drew me to Bitcoin. Um, it's what I'm doing quite a bit of my work at the moment is with this thing called Actuar, uh, Tech. So, you know, you've got FinTech and InsureTech. We want to create technology yeah. around actuarial science. Um, and we've got a cool website. We're writing a bunch of articles. But one of the little projects I've been thinking about is actually making an, and, and I know when people say AI, it's like a oh, buzzword, but actually making a, like a proper AI that goes through the investment process that I described a little bit earlier, you know, that, that it actually would go through um, yeah. and, and put it on the bond market. Like I said, companies, there's too much, there's too much data, there's too much noise to do it on, on stocks. But I think you could create a, an AI that can go and analyze every single bond in the world, you know, by looking at, so you take each country, you look at various key economic factors, um, unemployment rate, inflation, interest rates, business confidence, um, GDP, you know, exchange rates to dollar, whatever. You know, there's a bunch of these, these economic indicators. And this data is available um, either for free or you can get it at quite a decent price. Um, and what you do is you take those, those time series, that's kind of your input. And then what you also input are your bond yield curves and also how they've changed throughout the year. You put that in a simple AI, you teach it, you know, you can put it either with some Bayesian parameters, let it recalibrate, let it do this, let it find the various correlations. And it can actually tell you, you know, then you map it to the rest of the world. And it might even say, hey, Germany is uh, undervalued, or ooh, Japan's overvalued, or hey, Mexico's a good buy. And then, like I said, you take that information, I would then go to, to an investment bank, and say I want to build um, derivatives that you know track the the price or the yield of these bonds and have a bit of a magnifying effect on it. So every time you know it goes down one bit, I want my my instrument to to move a hundred bits. You know you can create that, yeah. um, especially if you're going with a pension fund money. You know and you're like I've got like you know a hundred million rand to do this. Investment banks are going to be like oh right this way sir. You know would you like a <laughs> you know can we get you I a cup of coffee? Yes, very, very much like what, what you saw in the big short is, you know, that they made that look quite cool. You know how the guy walks in and he's like, I'm going to create a product. People are creating products every single day. I mean, and this is something where um, you get some people who say start actuarial science and then they leave actuarial science to do something called quantitative finance. 
and that's where they just focus on the financial side of, of actuary, so they don't worry about regulation and thinking about, you know, what do trustees need and all that. They just focus on how to make the best financial product. You know, they become very, very yeah. specialized. Um, and I've been trying to reach out to the guy at the University of Cape Town to try to get him on my YouTube channel, the lecturer there, just to talk more about it because it is a question I get asked a lot and I don't know that much about it. Um, so I'm trying to get him on the channel to just talk more. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of like you can go in and create a product. And then, like I said, you can use your, your AI as your investment assistant. Um, another thing that you can do is there's this technology called natural language processors, which mm. it's very, very simple technology. It's a bunch of logical statements like if this, then that, if this number's past this threshold, then that. And then it takes that information and basically just writes it in, in English or in a more readable format. And you could basically get your natural language processor with a, a simple set of rules, feed it through all the government uh, data of the world, and it can actually create a nice little report. So I could almost even have a website where people are like, hmm, the South African bonds. And instead of seeing weird squiggles, which not a lot of people understand, bond curves and how they work and interest rates and all that, it can very quickly say in a short sentence, South African bonds are a great buyer right now. And then if you're like, ooh, yeah. I want to know more, it can be like, because you know it's created in the average in this area, okay, unemployment is a key concern, but we do think it will, you know, and you can basically, you could set up a very web, a cool website that displays this information, make the top half yeah. free, the bottom half, you have to watch an ad. You know, we'll, we'll do what Facebook does, put, a, put an ad right in the middle of the good stuff. Um, yeah. And Joey, you, you could actually make a, and like I said, you get an AI to do it with a bunch of rules, um, and then bam, you've got all that data very nicely packaged, and you could, like I said, it could even be a good project to do because then you can imagine if it is valuable, these big pension funds will be like, hey, who's this kid? You know, maybe let's consult with him. <laughs> he kind of knows what he's doing. Yeah. And that's why I, I, I always tell people if you're going to do something cool, you know, make it for free, put it online for free, especially initially, because that's how you get discovered. A lot of people who, you know, especially at our age, who try and do something cool, but they keep it a secret because they want people to copy them or they want to charge, you know, and I said, you know, never milk the baby cow too soon. Um, make something like this, put it up for free. If you want to make a little bit of revenue, put a little bit of ads maybe, but generally have something like this for free and that's how you get the attention of, of big clients. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's like I said, if, if, if my clients do dry up, I, at least I do have some of these, these crazy <laughs> projects that yeah. I can start implementing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually saw during the whole Bitcoin craze, I saw a video back then where someone used natural language processing on um, Twitter. Oh, yes. And managed to fit um, the light, the um, price of Bitcoin, like pretty, pretty like close, just mm -hmm. using tweets about Bitcoin. Yes, it's very, very powerful. It, like surprised me how, like it, it looked like he did it in an afternoon. I'm sure usually mm -hmm. editing and stuff. It took him a bit longer, but it didn't take him all that long to do. And 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 that's. I mean, this the thing is one of the things they say about actuaries is that we're lifelong learners. So even though we finished these, uh, you know, eight years of exams, my studying hasn't stopped. It's kind of like okay. What is the new technology that I need to learn? Um, of course, artificial intelligence, it's fun, it's exciting. It links up very nicely with Bayesian statistics. So, you know, something that I'll at least know the foundations to. But natural language yeah. processes, cloud computing, I mean, it's, it's quite fun, you know, building a project in the cloud. Um, I had a go at making that, that, uh, that social currency called Hypecoin uh, on, on a on Firebase. Look, it got hacked to, to yeah. shreds. Um, but at least, you know, and it, it cost a lot of money in the, the long run. But, you know, I learned quite a lot. It was really cool playing with that cloud technology, seeing what it can do, what it can't do. Um, when it's come to blockchain as well, I've set up various virtual machines, you know, running nodes, doing this, doing that. And it's, it's amazing at how many toys, tech toys there are out there that when you combine it with just a little bit of financial knowledge, you can start automating these things and really getting some cool uh, processes and results. And I think that's yeah. what we, we're going to see is we, we're at the moment, we've discovered data. That's where the humanity is. It's like, wow, there's data. But now there's like, there's too much data. 
and you know data scientists are like the hot job because they're like yeah we can we can understand it but that's going to get automated soon and people are going to start building tools that you know condense this data and put it in, in a nice meaningful way that people can then extract information and you know make knowledgeable decisions on so I, I'm like I say another thing I always tell the, the students on my channel is you got to learn programming uh, programming just teaches you the language of technology uh, so that you can understand these new um, and cool things that are coming up and yeah, I really think that you combine finance with a tech understanding and you could very well become the next Warren Buffett type of thing. I don't think it's that far-fetched to see that the, you know, the next richest guy is going to be someone coming again from the tech uh, area. I mean you look at Bill Gates, you yeah. look at Bezos, they're coming from tech and I don't think any yeah. any other reason why the next tech guy isn't going well the next richest guy is going to come from tech um uh, i think that it, that's kind of a given mm. i think the, the way things are going yeah the next richest guy has to come from tech and, and you look bill gates was basically making operating systems uh bezos was doing retail you know these retail is it's quite an old business i mean people have been selling goods yeah. at a market for a long time um, yeah. I think the next big thing, well, Zuckerberg also came up with just, you know, socializing. I mean, that's also a very simple thing. Another simple thing that's gone on for a long time, but is very important to our economy is investing. It is understanding all these type of things. And I think that's going to be, yeah, I think the next richest man is going to be a guy who can create an AI or something like that. that can do the investment process. Uh, doesn't have to do it 100 percent just can do it well enough so that he can look at all the markets at once and get that holistic yeah. view and then make those key decisions and i think the first guy to do yeah. that you're going to have all all the money all the institutional money is going to be saying okay we have to put 40 percent in equities flip let's put it in that guy because he's got a really sophisticated machine that kind of it's run by an ai so the fees are low and it's getting all the benefits of active management you know people are going to pump that in if you can give, like I yeah. say, low fees of passive um, management, but with the supposed advantage of active management, and an AI can produce that, then you're on for a bit of a winner. So the market would look really interesting having an AI that had money that was getting pumped mm -hmm. into it, like, and it was having to allocate it. Yeah, as it was yeah, getting pumped into it, that size of money. Well, well yeah. you, you look at you look at that guy um, who started Vanguard. And he's, he basically started passive investing. He changed the game of yeah. investing where he said, you know what? Instead of me sitting down and trying to say, ah, oh, this stock, this stock, that stock, he says, I'm just going to buy every single stock according to their market cap. So if this company's got 20% of the market cap, I'll put 20% behind it. If they got 5% of the market cap, I'll put 5%. And he said, I'll do that. And he said, my fee, he made a little budget. He says, I need $1,000, whatever, to let's say run this business a month. Um, when I've got this amount of investment. If I have this much investment, I can reduce my fees, you know, as a percentage, so that I keep that $1,000. And that's what he did. The more money came in, he lowered his fees. Which, what did that cause? More money to come in, which caused him to lower his fees a little bit more, which caused even more money yeah. to come in. And I was reading at one stage, this guy's getting $1 billion every single day of inflow. That's what it averages up to. Look, he, he's... <laughs> He, he unfortunately died, uh, you know, quite recently um, yeah, yeah, because, yeah. you know, he set this up, I think, you know, in the late 80s. But he basically created like an automatic investing process. It was basically, yeah. it, it wasn't even AI, it was dumb. It just, it was like, I'm just going to invest according to this one rule. More market cap, more investment. That was it. Now, imagine if you yeah. put in a little bit of sneakier rule and people are trying to do that. I mean... There are passive the funds model yes, like that. that do incorporate a bit of a style and they try to do this and they, you know, they try to warrant their higher fees. And, you know, we are seeing, you know, passive funds, and this is what makes you know, my job a little bit more interesting, is it's not a binary position of, oh, it's passive or it's active. You know, you've got all these little, the spectrum of things to choose from. And then, of course, there's the whole core satellite approach where you can have your majority in passive and, you know, a little bit in these boutique funds. So that's where the job does get a little bit complicated as, as an actuary. Um, but like I said, if you can go and create a, an AI, um, 
And like I say, I would start with the bond market just because it's simpler, the information's there, it's more transparent, they've been going on for a lot longer. Um, there's no survivorship bias like you kind of get with the stock market. You know, you're only looking at the winners. Yeah. You're not looking at the companies that blew up like Enron and that type of stuff. Um, yeah. I, I think it's possible. I really think it's think it's a possible uh, project. Yeah. And yeah, it could be could be a fun one to yeah see where it goes. Yeah, and I'm sure if you if you try and do some of these things, you do tend to put them on your YouTube. So um, in the show notes of this and on the YouTube description will definitely link to your YouTube channel. No, no, thank you. Yeah, I've spent many hours um, watching just even your your videos on like the actuarial exams, like just so interesting (laughs) stuff that you're doing. No, (laughs) thank you. Study videos and whatnot. Thank you very much. It's, 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 I must say it's it's weird making YouTube videos because you, you know, you've got a lot of this like self-conscious feeling, especially when you look at your videos that you made like two or three years ago. Like oh gosh, that's that's so cringy. Gosh, why was I so excited on that topic? So I'm like, hey guys, you know. Um, so <laughs> it's 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 yeah, it's, it's definitely something that uh, yeah people make a few jokes about. But it's I'm just glad that yeah, it's I, I find it it helps me think by talking. Um, like I said, my yeah. parents are, are tired of, of hearing about me, so I thought let me bore the internet. Um, so I'm I'm grateful that your yeah, people are actually listening to to my craziness. And no, thank yeah, you. Definitely. I much appreciate that. Yeah, so um, we're actually running out of time here, Matt. Let's go in a second. Um, so thanks for coming on the podcast. No, it's an absolute um, pleasure. I've, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, it's not, not the direction I thought the conversation was going to go, but I'm glad it went that way. Um, so I'm going to go and research bonds a little bit more now. Um, <laughs> I definitely know how little I know <laughs> yeah. after talking to you. So. Yeah, I'm going to do some research myself. <laughs> yeah, so thanks so much for coming on. Um, and yeah, like I said, we'll be definitely be linking to your YouTube channel, um, so you so our listeners can go and check that out because it's definitely very, very, very interesting information over there. Fantastic. No, thanks so much, guys. And Joe, you've got a yeah, you know, it's, it's night time on your side, so have a great weekend. Yeah, it is. Um, for me, Friday's <laughs> only just begun, so I've got your. Yeah, Bit of work to do, <laughs> but uh, to do. yeah. But thanks so much, and yeah, have a great time, hey guys. Yeah, thanks, MJ. Cool, cheers, eh?